part two of a film about a voyage up the coast of West Africa from Cape Town, South Africa to Lisbon, Portugal. Our voyage up the coast of West Africa continued from Sao Tome and Principe across the Gulf of Guinea to the fascinating countries of Benin, Togo and Ghana. Along the Gulf of Guinea, we visited the areas around the cities of Cotonou in Benin, Lome in Togo and Accra and Takoradi in Ghana. Piracy in the Gulf of Guinea affects shipping. Pirates in the Gulf are often part of heavily armed criminal enterprises who employ violent methods to steal oil cargo. As a result of the threat of piracy, our ship steered well clear of Nigeria and kept a sharp lookout for pirate vessels. As we neared Cotonou, a large number of inshore fishing boats dotted the water. These small, colorfully painted fishing boats frequently have inspirational quotes, many from the Bible, painted on them. As at every other port in the area, a local pilot came on board, even though navigation into these ports was not tricky. The fishermen are religious and can be regularly seen praying as they head out to sea on their small boats. Many of the boats fly colorful flags so that they can be recognized amongst the throng of boats dotting the ocean. The shoreline near the Cotonou port was lined with a shanty town for fishermen. Approaching the entrance to the port of Cotonou, a ship suddenly exited the port, forcing our ship to make an emergency stop by reversing its propellers. The local pilot on board our ship went ballistic on the radio with the captain of the ship exiting the port, including asking him if he wanted to destroy the ships. <laughs> You want to destroy the boat? Yeah, fool, what? With the collision averted, we proceeded into the port of Cotonou, which was busy with the unloading of a giant vehicle carrier, which we tied up in front of, and we were soon off on our bus tour of the region around Cotonou. Our tour in the Cotonou area first took us to a lake with a village of stilt huts called Ganvier, and then to the town of Ouida, the spiritual capital of Voodoo, and once a major slave trading post. As elsewhere in West Africa, we had an armed escort both for protection and to move our vehicle expeditiously along in heavy traffic. The police were very effective in clearing a path through the traffic and their authority was obvious. Cotonou is a city of motorbikes and like most of West Africa, they are Chinese-built motorbikes. Traders legally purchase fuel in Nigeria where subsidies keep prices much lower and then smuggle the fuel into Benin mainly using waterways. At Lac Nakue, we took a motorboat across over to Ganvier, passing by boats carrying residents to and from Ganvier, as well as lots of fishermen out plying their trade in the lake. Some of the local women on their boats covered their faces to prevent their photos being taken as they feel like such photos are used by tourists to make money. Many of the fishermen on Lake Nakue practice brush park fishing or Akaja fisheries by anchoring brush into the lake bed in order to form artificial systems aimed at enhancing fish production by providing an enhancement for the development of plants and animals upon which the fish will feed. It was fascinating to watch the fishermen skillfully casting their nets. However, there didn't appear to be many fish being caught. On the slave coast, the African Kingdom of Dahomey was the top slave trading partner with Europeans, exchanging slaves for goods and firearms. 
so rapacious were the kings of Dahomey in their slave grabbing that desperate methods were devised to escape them. Since superstition prevented the slavers pursuing potential slaves over water, a village of stilt huts called Ganvier was built several miles out on Lake Nakue to protect them from the slavers. Ganvier is still home to around 30,000 people. We cruise through the labyrinth of canals, passing by a market conducted entirely on boats and buildings on stilts, including a school, hospitals, houses, and shops. <laughs> The most interesting sight to see in town was the voodoo trance dancers in their multicolored clothing. Just as the voodoo trance dancers started, a boat carrying an impressive load of brush park fishing material sailed past us. Trance dancers were accompanied by a minder who used a stick to keep dancers from contacting the audience and to adjust their clothing without touching them directly by hand. Voodoo trance dancers, also called a gungung, representing the souls of the dead, are some of the most powerful voodoo figures. Anyone touching them or their colorful robes, even accidentally, will die, as must the gungung. Hence, a minder follows them around with a stick to prevent any contact with the gungung. Once ashore from Ganvier, we headed west to the town of Ouida, which is located near the coast. to Ouida was a very rough dirt road, which surprisingly was a toll road. Although there was some road work being carried out, the rough road had caused a number of vehicle breakdowns. Ouida is the spiritual capital of Voodoo and was once a major slave trading post. The Fort of São João Baptiste de Ajoa is a small fortress built by the Portuguese in 1680 to protect the African slave trade that mainly sent slaves to Brazil. Today the fort is the History Museum of Ouida. Ouida was founded in the 16th century and currently has a population of some 80,000 people. 
In the 18th century, it was captured by the Kingdom of Dahomey, whose troops relentlessly raided the interior, capturing millions of people to sell as slaves to the Europeans and Arabs. The sacred forest of Kapasa in Wida is the spiritual place that is the resting place of King Kapasa, the first king of Wida. Nearing death, he disappeared and turned into a small Iroko tree growing in the forest. The sacred forest has a number of statues representing the voodoo divinities. The statue of Legba, the virile trickster, is popular to touch as hopefully it acts as voodoo Viagra. The forest floor was alive with interesting insects, including centipedes and millipedes. Some of the trees in the sacred forest were full of hundreds of noisy, roosting fruit bats. During the era of slavery, which ended in the early 1800s, in Wida's slave markets, slaves captured by African kings from all over West Africa were sold to foreign buyers for shipment, mainly to the New World. Once a slave ship arrived offshore, slaves were marched in chains along the Route de l'Esclave, which was a three-mile dusty track leading down to the beach. A triangular trade system was developed that saw manufactured goods sent from Europe to African rulers in exchange for slaves who were in turn shipped to the New World to produce raw materials that were sent back to Europe. Along the Route de l'Esclave stood the Tree of Forgetfulness, around which slaves were marched up to nine times so as to erase their homeland and families from their memories. It is estimated that over the centuries of the slave trade, some one million people were captured as slaves and were sent abroad from Ouida, mainly to Brazil. On the coast at the end of the Route de l'Esclave is the Port de Nouretour monument, dedicated to Africans sent abroad as slaves. This is one of several doors of no return. Slaves were sold to foreigners in exchange for various products such as alcohol, weapons and cannons. For example, 10 men or 21 women were worth a single cannon. The beaches near Wida are very nice and largely deserted save for the inshore fishermen and their old boats. The old fishing boat was decorated with protective symbols, including a snake, which is a very important spirit in voodoo. The servant spirit, Dambala, created the cosmos by using his coils to form the stars and the planets, and by shedding his skin to create all the waters on the earth. More importantly, to small boat fishermen, Dambala is the protector of the helpless. Also on the beach was a rondevel shaped voodoo temple and an interesting monument to early Christian missionaries to Benin. The Casa del Papa resort where we had lunch is situated on a wonderful stretch of golden sand beach. The quotations written on the boats, frequently from the Bible, were always interesting to read. Leaving Ouida, we headed back to Cotonou, where we encountered local flooding on the road. We had a wonderful welcome back at the ship, followed by an excellent birthday celebration. And a, a beautiful bottle of champagne at supper yeah. time as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. What a special, special. birthday. Yes. <laughs> Happy oh. birthday, dear Donna. From Cotonou, we sailed 140 kilometers west to Lome, Togo. After a short sail from Cotonou, we arrived off the port of Lome in the early morning 
and pass by a number of small inshore fishing boats heading out to fish. As at most other ports, the captain reversed into the berth to expedite our ensuing departure. We had one of the most interesting dockside welcomes of our voyage, this time by a cultural group that included fascinating stilt walkers and dancers dressed in colorful voodoo-related costumes. While the stilts can raise the walkers up to four meters off the ground, the walkers still performed amazing tricks. Traditionally, stilts held mysterious powers to local voodoo practitioners. As elsewhere, we had an amazing motorcycle policeman as an escort to ensure that we could move about rapidly given our tight timetable. From Lome, we headed north up country with our first stop being at a rural primary school. In Lome, our motorcycle escort cut a very commanding presence and had a no-nonsense attitude towards his work. The police riders are popular with the people who wave at them as they pass by. It was amazing to watch this fearless police rider drive straight at oncoming traffic to force it to the side of the road. The traffic on the road at the Mokoviad Primary School included a motorbike transporting goats. by a welcome dance before visiting the village and its school. It was fascinating to poke around the village just to see how basic the villagers' lives were. Togo is one of the world's poorest countries with many of its people surviving on subsistence farming. About 60% of the nation's population of 7.5 million is under the age of 25 and it is affected by poor living conditions and unemployment. As elsewhere in this part of Africa, the villagers practice voodoo. The bush around the village was prime habitat for butterflies. Surprisingly, it was a young man working the weaving machine. We need to go back to the bustle, please. The primary school seemed well run and enabled the children to receive a solid basic education. 
The school had a large map of Togo on it, as well as a map of Africa. One cause of pause with our visit was that the children left the school after our visit was over. <laughs> Leaving the school, we headed up north into the hill country to visit a village on Mount Cloto. The villagers happily ignored the old sign warning not to build beside the road. The motorcycle police escort never ceased to amaze us with his boldness and daring in the performance of his duties. The interesting scenes on road to Cloto included numerous scenes of roadside charcoal vendors. Finally, we climbed up Mount Cloto to a small village where we were greeted with a welcome dance. We sampled some sodabe, or palm wine, which is locally known as Baldan wine due to its potency. We didn't buy the extrinsic Canadian winter scene in Togo, but instead purchased Togolese bowls with an interesting intertwined tripod stand. A walk around the village revealed interesting scenes including villagers and tropical fruits and plants. Leaving Cloto, our motorcycle escort took us back south to Lome. During our return to Lome, we passed by opposition supporters of the National Alliance for Change, which seeks an end to the reign of the Nessing Bay family, which has been in power in Togo since 1967. Back in Lome, we visited a voodoo temple to witness the fascinating ceremony which involved much dancing and drumming and some participants entering into a trance. We were lucky to be invited to sit with the voodoo leaders and to be served a shot of rum that helps the spirits or Iwa to enter the body. Gunpowder is used to precipitate magically the mysteres or spirits which act as intermediaries between humans and Bondi or the Supreme Creator. 
The Voodoo Altar allows adherents to connect with and to honor ancestors. Across the street from the temple was a small dressmaking shop with old foot-powered sewing machines. After reboarding our ship, we ate a wonderful snack left for us in our cabin, and then we watched a final performance by the Ballet Leon Gold Troupe in the theater. Late at night, we sailed from Lome to our next port of call on the coast of the Gulf of Guinea. From Lome, we sailed 170 kilometers west-southwest to Accra, Ghana. After a short sail from Lome, we arrived off the port of Tema, which serves as Accra's port. This time we arrived in the early morning and again passed by a number of small inshore fishing boats returning home from fishing. Coming into Tema Port, 29 kilometers from Accra, we could see the wreck of a fishing boat lying off the breakwater. At the dock, we were met by a bus and an impressive motorcycle police escort to ensure that we could move rapidly about given our tight timetable. We soon headed off to see some of the sights in Accra, the capital of the Republic of Ghana, that city that has an estimated population of two and a half million people. Our first stop was at the famous Kane Kiwe Carpentry Workshop, which is widely known for its design coffins, which have become symbolic of African artistic creativity. The workshop was established in the 1950s and it started making figurative coffins inspired by the figurative palanquins which were used as coffins by traditional chiefs of the Ga people, an ethnic group in the Accra area. The symbols on the figurative palanquins were to ensure protection by the spirits and the ancestors which are connected to the respective symbol. In the early 1960s, the use of figurative coffins for Ga burial rites became widespread. After the coffin is built from wood pieces, the inside is lined with fabric, while the outside is decorated by a painter and then finished to give it a highly polished surface. The coffins range from representations of careers such as a lobster for a fisherman or a hammer for a carpenter, to depictions of the deceased's habits such as a Bible for a religious person or a big pen for a writer. Ashanti and Ashanti is like a nation. We talk about Ashanti nation. I will come back to this, which is very interesting. And Ashanti nation, we still have a king. 
which is still very powerful. The Omani House Art Gallery is a modern three-floored art gallery that offers for sale a collection of traditional and contemporary African art, including excellently finished figurative coffins for the foreign art collector. The fishing ports were chock-a-block with small inshore fishing boats. Near a small fishing village, we came across tired inshore fishermen who had just returned from fishing at dawn and were emptying and cleaning their nets. The size of the catch from these fishing boats was small given the number of fishermen and boats involved. It is estimated that the over a quarter of a million artisanal fishermen who work on some 29,000 fishing vessels have seen their catch decline from some 420,000 tons in 1999 to 202,000 tons in 2014. This reduction is largely attributed to overfishing by foreign vessels, many Chinese, some of which use illegal practices including light fishing, the use of dynamite and carbide gas, as well as prohibited fishing nets. In response to the illegal fishing practices by foreign vessels, some inshore fishermen have adopted some illegal practices, which has put further pressure on the fish stocks. In the market, women were cooking fish for sale. However, surprisingly, the fish were not caught locally. Rather, they came from the United States. We walked around the town to get a feel for life in a fishing community and encountered a number of interesting sites. During our walkabout, we encountered curious school kids, incongruous ski boots and skates for sale where snow is nowhere to be found, curious babies who had never seen a Caucasian before, and brightly decorated buildings. Leaving the fishing community, we were off to see Black Star Square, which is the second largest city square in the world after Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Black Star Square, also known as Independence Square, is a public square that was commissioned by Nakome Kruma to honor the 1961 visit of Queen Elizabeth II to Ghana. The square has two monuments, namely the Black Star Gate and the Independent Arch. The square hosts Ghana's Independence Day parades, major national public gatherings and national festivals. The statue of the soldier that faces the Independence Arch symbolizes the Ghanaians who lost their lives fighting for Ghana's independence. Down the road from Black Star Square is the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum which holds the remains of Kwame Nkrumah who was the first Prime Minister and President of Ghana having led it to independence for Britain in 1957. In February 1966 after six years in power while Nkrumah was abroad on a state visit to North Vietnam and China his government was overthrown in a violent coup d'etat led by the military and the police forces. Nkrumah never returned to Ghana and died abroad in 1972. The grounds of the mausoleum are beautifully kept. Across Independence Avenue from the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum are the beautiful British colonial era buildings built in 1929, which now house the Supreme Court of Ghana. With our Accra City tour over, we headed up country to the town of Odumasi Krobo to see the CD beads industry, where traditional techniques are used to make colorful glass beads that are sold around the world. Due to traffic congestion, getting out of Accra was difficult and would have been impossible without our motorcycle police escort who effectively cleared our way through the heavy traffic. On our way to the town of Odumasi Krobo, it was interesting to watch the passing scene and to read the wonderful names given to businesses. For example, a corner store was named Let Praise the Lord. The road
road to CD Beads industry is a rough and unpaved one, but the bus got us there, where we were greeted with a welcome dance performed by dancers draped in necklaces made from colorful CD beads. The beads are made from used glass bottles which would otherwise be thrown into a ditch or a field as there is no official garbage collection or recycling plants in Ghana. In the first step, the glass bottles are pounded and ground down into very fine pieces using a metal pipe inside a large plastic bucket. In the second step, the ground up glass is then placed in various shaped molds before being fused together in small kilns made of mud from termite mounds. Once out of the kiln, the beads are cooled in water and then the colorful beads are cleaned using sand. Once finished, the colorful glass beads are hard to resist so we bought some necklaces and bracelets and Mr. CD himself rung up our purchases. Leaving CD beads, our motorcycle escort took us back to Accra and we returned to our ship and as darkness fell we slipped our mooring lines and headed out of the port of Tema. After the Tema pilot left us, one of the searchlights was turned on to help see any small inshore fishing boats. From Accra, we sailed 190 kilometers west-southwest to Takaradi, Ghana. No 9, no 10 is the Ghanaian version of Ubuntu, which means if you don't allow your friends to reach 9, you'll never reach 10. In other words, you'll never rise above the limitations that you place on others. It was interesting to see what insects had come aboard overnight as we cruised along the coast. Standing off Takarati was a cutter dredger ship and a ubiquitous offshore oil platform. The inshore fishermen heading out to fish had a tiny lifeboat on board, so one wonders how they would decide who would use it should the fishing boat sink. In short order, a pilot boat arrived and the local pilot for Takarati port clambered on board and then we headed into port. The freighter in port offloading gravel had barbed wire along its railings to act as an anti-boarding obstacle to any would-be pirates scrambling aboard. We were met K-side by a group of uniformed government representatives and a motorcycle policeman who provided an amazing police escort service to us. Soon we were off to Kakam National Park to make the canopy walk high over the jungle floor. It was at Takarati where we had our most dramatic and entertaining police escort. It was amazing to watch this fearless police rider drive straight at oncoming traffic to force it to the side of the road.
The amazing performance of the police escorts during our voyage up the coast of West Africa left a lasting impression on us. As elsewhere in our travels, the scenes of life as we drove along the roads were interesting and included a driving school car that was missing a wheel, perhaps from an errant student driver. Kakam National Park is located 33 kilometers north of Almina. It was established in 1931 and covers an area of some 375 square kilometers of tropical rainforest. The park is one of the few locations in Africa with a canopy walkway. On the walk to the start of the canopy walkway, we had an opportunity to see some of the insects and lizards that inhabit the jungle floor. Unfortunately, there were many school kids there for the canopy walkway, whose boisterous behavior frightened away any birds or animals in the canopy. The walkway, which is 350 meters long, is comprised of seven bridges that are suspended up to 43 meters off the jungle floor. Even though the canopy walkway is 43 meters off the jungle floor, the walkway start is from high ground, so there is no significant climb necessary to get to the walkway. The bridges do sway a bit, which tends to make one initially apprehensive, but it doesn't take long to get accustomed to the swaying. There is an escape route after a couple of bridges that allows people who realize the walk is not for them to bail out and to take a shortcut back to the safety of the ground. At a height of 43 meters off the jungle floor, visitors can view plants and animals from a vantage point that would otherwise be inaccessible to people. Near the restaurant, vendors offer honey and cocoa pods for sale. Leaving the park, we headed back to the coast to visit Almina Castle. Almina got its name from the Portuguese in the 15th century when the name Almina, or the mine, referred to the gold that could be found there. Hence this area was called the Gold Coast before being changed to Ghana post-independence. We stopped to see an artisanal palm oil extraction operation. To extract the palm oil, palm fruit from the African oil palm tree is heated in big pots over a wood-fueled fire. The ground around the operation was very slippery because of the palm oil that had been spilled over the years on the ground. In the final step, the oil is separated out from the palm fruit solids by means of a hand-powered press as the old motorized press was not working. The final product of palm oil is an edible vegetable oil. This motorcycle policeman displayed impressive riding skills and an uncommon zest for his job, which made it mesmerizing to watch him at work. Elmina Castle was first built by the Portuguese in 1482 as Sal Jorge da Mina, or St. George of the Mine Castle, to protect trade. It is the oldest European building in existence south of the Sahara. In 1637, after Almina was taken over by the Dutch, they built a smaller fortress in 1652 called Fort Konradsburg on a hill nearby to protect Almina from inland attacks. The Dutch seized Almina Castle from the Portuguese in 1637 and in 1872 the Gold Coast, including Almina, became a possession of the British Empire until Britain granted the Gold Coast its independence in 1957. A moat now dry protects the castle walls that in turn protected the African headquarters of the Dutch West Indies Company for over 200 years. We left a floral tribute at the confinement cells that held slaves who had revolted or were seen as rebellious. The group of local students crowding into the dungeon was like a scene from the history of the slave trade. The slaves were held in the dungeon for up to three months before exiting through the castle's infamous door of no return to be loaded onto waiting ships mainly for transport to and sail in the Portuguese colony of Brazil. The door is quite narrow to restrict slaves from physically resisting. The slave ship from Elmina mostly went to Brazil on a sailing ship that took several months to make the crossing. Overlooked by Elmina Castle is the Benia Lagoon, which is an amazingly busy fishing harbor that is full of colorful traditional inshore fishing boats called pirogues. Fishermen are busy tending nets, coming and going to sea, and selling their catch in the local fish market. The fishing boat heading out to sea bore the label of John chapter 10 verse 30, a biblical verse quoting Jesus' as saying, My sheep, they shall never perish, which is quite comforting for fishermen who must brave the vagaries of the ocean. As the crew passed by Elmina Castle and out to sea, the crew was praying, 
undoubtedly for deliverance from dangers on the ocean and for a good catch of fish. Unfortunately, without sanitation, the ocean becomes a toilet. After Almina, we headed back to our ship at Takarati, but first made a stop at the nearby Coconut Grove Beach Resort for lunch. The resort put on a wonderfully energetic performance by a local dance troupe, which was very reminiscent of a dance performance that we'd seen on Uapo in the Marquesas Islands. <laughs> Leaving the resort to return to Takarati, we had one final chance to watch in amazement as our motorcycle police escort performed his traffic escort magic past the remains of a totally demolished car. The Gold Coast Colonia era left behind a railroad infrastructure that is slowly disintegrating, including the attractive Gano Railroad Takarati Station that was near our ship in the port of Takarati. After the pilot was picked up by the pilot boat, we started on a leg of five sea days that would take us to Cape Verde. This voyage of five sea days arose because of the Ebola outbreak in parts of West Africa and the logistics problems that prevented a landing in Dakar, Senegal. Because of the prospects of five sea days, a third of the passengers left the ship at Takarati and flew home. However, we found the sea days quite relaxing and were rewarded with the sighting of a sperm whale. Luckily, the sperm whale that we encountered was logging on the surface so we could observe it for a good amount of time. The sperm whale is the largest of the tooth whales and the largest tooth predator on earth. It is the species of whales that was made famous by the novel Moby Dick written by Herman Melville in 1851. Females and young males live together in groups while mature males live solitary lives outside of the mating season. Hence this was probably a mature male. The sperm whale gets its name from spermaceti oil which is a waxy substance found in the head cavities of the sperm whale. A sperm whale can carry as much as 1900 liters, which made it a prime target of the whaling industry for use in oil lamps, lubricants and candles. As it is, the species is now protected by a whaling moratorium. Eventually the whale sounded and we got an excellent view of its tail fluke as it submerged. However, in its wake, the whale left a cloud of whale poop that stained a patch of the ocean. And so we sailed on north to Cape Verde. somewhere nice to some tired island in your heart